But little did we know that during the release, four months after the single came out, that we would all be in, in, in situations of completely changed lives, man. You know, mine was like, it, I mean, gee, I was sitting there going like, fuck, what is happening right now? <laughs> like, it can't keep, it can't keep selling 100,000 copies a week. You know, we can't stay in the top 100. What are we at days. right now? Just, just for my Jewish tabulation. So yeah. what are we, uh, <laughs> what are we at now for sales, Dave? Uh, we're looking at probably 18 million worldwide. We're working on eight in the States. Oh, only 18? Yeah, oh, just I thought you were going to say like 25. You're going to knock off Thriller <laughs> or something. Hello, welcome to another episode of 2020. My name is Corey Peza here, as always, with Siobhan and Ben. And uh, we have a super cool guest today. Uh, a guy rad that guest. We, rad, rad. Super rad. Super Fucking rad guy. Rad. Uh, a guy that, that we just were all hanging out with recently, which is always rare. You know, the, the 2020 crew is all in the same room. And uh, this guy, Dave Fortman, uh, incredible producer, guitarist for Ugly Kid Joe. You've heard his stuff, I promise you. Yeah, he gets into everything about producing the Evanescence album, how he got to working with Slipknot and Mudvayne and all sorts of the, all of the biggest people that you have heard of. He has been a part of in some way or another. And if you've ever felt like your drummer's difficult, well, Dave has some empathetic words for you. <laughs> so I don't want to give too much away. Just really cool stories and hearing how he got into this uh, incredible business and made this incredible career. So let's check it out. Part one with Dave Foreman. All right, my name is Betty Goodman, and I am here with my cohorts in crime, Corey Peza and Siobhan Cronin. Hi, guys. Hey, Ben. But today, we have one of the raddest dudes, and I use that word very specifically. He's one of the raddest <laughs> dudes on the fucking planet. He plays with a band that you might know called Ugly Kid Joe, but he's produced so many, so many bands from Slipknot to Evanescence to a bunch of number one records with Godsmack, a little band you might have heard of if you're from Boston or <laughs> anywhere on this fucking planet. Give it up for Mr. David Fortman! Oh Woo! Give me some love. <laughs> or not, or don't give me some love. <laughs> this and is this the feels e funny ego boost we, hour. We, we, <laughs> we, we just all saw each other in person, which is such a rare occurrence. It's like, know. you know, what, yeah. one of those rare solar eclipses or whatever, where we've all ended up in the same place. And now it's so funny to like be on the computer again. <laughs> and now we're <laughs> all we're back together. See, this is great. <laughs> back what, in what, an, what an intro, <laughs> Benny. Wow. What Just wait, he's got he's got more up his sleeve. He likes to it's drop a bunch of things at the here. end. Yeah, that's about as good as it's going to get. It's, that's it. It's over. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> Try the meatloaf. Yeah. So for, for our listeners and viewers, just to give you kind of like the context is we were literally just, you know, like, like a week or so ago all together uh, down in, in Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, so Ben and I escaped the Northeast for a little bit and uh, we we're working on our uh the apocalypse blues revival record which uh you know if you guys remember back the uh our shannon larkin episodes we, we kind of talked all about that um and it was it was crazy it was a great time uh and obviously we got to hang with uh you dave and oh, yeah. after after just a couple you know dinners after the recording sessions you know ben and i looked at each other we're like this guy needs to be on the podcast. <laughs> like, oh, thank it you. was it was pretty much Jeez. like this. It, there was no question about it. It was only. like this has to happen. <laughs> and it took me only a couple hours one afternoon to decide that. I knew right away. Yeah, I was well, like, "This yeah. can be awesome." Even at the final hour, that <laughs> it's it's Siobhan, but it, it's Siobhan, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just one Look way that my mom wanted to make my life more difficult than it already is. Well, that's for Irish, I believe, right? Siobhan. It's, it, yeah, it's Irish. Yeah. Yeah weird celtic pronunciation but. yeah wow i guess you end up in the pub late night <laughs> it's more my oh, mother wow. that does i'm kind of anti-social yeah. hermit but <laughs> oh wow we call we call that the celtics around here in boston javon <laughs> <laughs> well i'm half sicilian so i'm not 100 percent scottish celtic? celtic celtic yeah yeah celtic celtic i don't know wait but this episode is not Hill about Larry me Bird. are you talking about <laughs> basketball or like the celtic history here <laughs> what we're doing is, is, is immediately going off the rails uh as, right we, do, <laughs> as we do so i guess um you know f just to get started what we like to do is just get a little background um you know we try to f kind of follow how people get into these kind of careers that you know yeah. you're in and, and your story is uh, very interesting so maybe we can just kind of take it back and talk about you know your first uh foray into music and and when you were younger how, how did you begin on that path 
Uh, well, man, it's a long journey. I'm from a family of musicians. Uh, you know, my bro oldest brother is three, three boys. <clears throat> I had to clear my throat here, man. But three boys, uh, John, Brent, and Dave. I'm the youngest. And my father played trumpet. His dad played trumpet. So uh, both my brothers were into music. And my oldest brother taught me to play and read drum music, I think, when I was four or something. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so Drummers have music? <laughs> <laughs> were your brothers were they were they playing trumpet or were they like like how did the they were, music they were reading music, music and, and they were they were playing starting to take piano lessons trumpet piano, lessons okay. so we all became multi instrumentalists but the the idea that me so I got sort of advantage by being the youngest because then they would teach me because you know back then there was nothing else to do we would make drum sets out of pillows and you know and I was reading drum music you know wanting in it we you know the whole deal. By the time I was five, I was pretty proficient at it. But that leads into watching my brothers in school when they became drum majors in uh, first chair trumpet, you know, all the way through uh, for my entire life. That's how it was all the way getting out of high school. And so we were killing it. I was, you know, and so I started out in middle school. I think I was only in the fifth grade on drums, I played snare drum, and then all of a sudden I showed up with a trumpet, and you know, I started dominating that. And then I, you know, I went through to being drum major in ninth grade, and then I got in high school, and I had been playing, I had picked up guitar uh, really at an early age, probably seventh, maybe sixth grade, uh, with all the classics that my, I was, you know, you look up to your big brother, who's six years older when you're young, uh, and learned a bunch of stuff, you know, so, I became really great at guitar by the time I was in uh, 10th grade. Uh, I was the only kid in high school to play Eruption like that. <laughs> so then this became a band. Grade, wow. yeah, so it became a band uh, in 11th grade, it became a band with these two older guys, the two seniors that I knew, John LaCalle, John McNeely, still great friends of mine. <clears throat> and we developed a band in Louisiana and started to get massively popular. Uh, and that turned into starting to write original songs and what and uh, and what whatnots kind of a southern term. I don't know if you know that term. Oh yeah, <laughs> but uh, whatnot. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so we ended up uh, being at such a level that uh, EMI Records had come down at one point to see us. Uh, like just didn't want to sign us. So then that year. I decided, you know, I need the next step in my life. So I moved to California. I went to Los Angeles with this band. And so that ended up being sort of the regular steps of destiny. I ended up meeting, you know, we weren't doing that great, just try, like minor club gigs. But then I, one of my buddies was out there and I got in a band called Sugar Tooth with him, which got signed so to. How how old were you when you moved? Uh, I moved at, uh, at 20 three or I think 20, maybe 22. I moved, I got out of Louisiana with, and then the band, we all went out there and we started playing a bunch of gigs, but you know, as destiny would have it, uh, you know, strange things happen to me. They always have, uh, you know, one of my friends, Tim Gruse, who I, I call him like the, you know, the, the, my key destiny dude. Well, when I moved out there, I was trying to get a job, with uh one of my uncles that my mom was hooking me up with so they were that co it was a copper company they were just going to go out there and work you know and then try to make music but then that copper company happened to be in sherman oaks california and so when i talked to tim my buddy who had already moved out there and he was in a different band uh he said you know call me when you get to los angeles you know and it's obviously a big fucking place mm -hmm. so when i got there uh, based on the, the idea that I was going to work in Sherman Oaks, uh, I had the other band members secure their lives as well. We all, you know, two of us got an apartment together, Sherman Oaks. The other one was somewhere in North Hollywood, right? A couple of miles down the road. Well, that night, you know, I said, well, shit, Tim told me to call him. And so uh, I did. And he says, wait, where'd you move to, bro? <laughs> I'm like, well, I moved to Sherman Oaks. He's like, well, that's where I live. Like, he goes, what streets are you on? I'm like, I'm on Magnolia in Sepulveda. He's like, well, step out your door, you know, you know, and, and, and go down, go to the, go up to Sepulveda and take a right. And he was literally a block uh -huh. away from out of, out of just random choice oh my up being in the same area. So anyway, he, he was a first in his band, which at the time was called, she died. And the singer was, uh, 
Burko, Robert Weber, who ended up being an A&R guy, signed Disturbed and all these bands. Well, they at some point had a drummer and a guitar player quit. And so they invited me and, and Joey Castillo at the time was from Wasted Youth, who went on, obviously, I, mean, you, you, I hope you know who that is, right? The drummer, Queens of Stone Age, Joey Castillo, Danzig. Oh, yeah. Of course. Well, I mean, he's so Randy Castillo, who used to go around his drum set and play with his hands on Ozzy. Yeah. So <laughs> different. That was pretty cool, too. <laughs> but also, Randy's dead. So, I mean, yeah. I guess Joey's probably in a better situation. Yeah, two Castillos. Yeah, Joey's much more punk rock. But so we ended up in, in a practice room together with these guys. You know, they were called She Died. And uh, with Tim, my buddy. And Joey, me and Joey played together, and that was game over, man. Joey came to me and said, look, I don't really like the band that much, but I'll play with you if you want to play live. And so we proceeded to take over Hollywood at the moment, and we ended up being one of the the heaviest hitters in Hollywood. And some of the warm-up bands that we had were, you know, little bands that no one's heard of, Rage Against the Machine, <laughs> Stone Temple Pilots. Rage Against the Machine probably warmed up. At the, you know, we play the Clover on Hollywood B Boulevard with those guys, and there's nobody in the place. 13 people watching us, you know, and Rage Against the Machine's going crazy in there. And we're like, what is wrong with Zach? Why is he losing his mind? There's 15 people in the bar. Relax, Tiger. And none of us could see it coming. And then uh, Stone Chip Pilots back then was called Mighty Joe Young, you know, and they warmed up a, a bunch of shows for us as we proceeded to get signed to Geffen Records. Now, during this time, <clears throat> I had made friends with these two dudes from a band called Ugly Kid Jeff. And I met them at, we had the same lawyer and I met him at a dinner one night. So we spent a little over a year together with me finishing band practice with Sugar Tooth, which that, what that became later was Sugar Tooth. And I would go to Santa Barbara to go see my friends. And so we became such dear friends and they offered an opportunity of a lifetime where they, you know, when I quit Sugar Tooth to go to Ugly Kid Joe, the, it was not only friendship, but it was also, the fact that I really believed in wit and, and they had already gotten, they were starting to, to build, you know, they sold 30,000 units. They got a video on MTV and wit was adamant that I, I go that route and join with that band. So that's what I did. So that brought me into the next level. Wait, for, was, for my mom who doesn't know who wit is, yeah. Whitfield Crane, the legendary singer of ugly kid Joe. Mom, exactly. you're welcome. <laughs> Dave continue. <laughs> <laughs> No, this is good because I come from the classical world. Like we talk about this on this show too. I mean, yeah. there are a lot of things in sort of rock history that I'm totally He's actually unaware of. Also. Box 37 children was Whitfield Crane. Did you not know that? <laughs> Whitfield Crane Box. <laughs> 37 <laughs> kids from Bach would be amazing. I think he actually, actually had like good. 30 kids. Oh, I have no see. doubt that he fathered at least that many. Yeah, I mean, he probably did. I heard he used to, you know, wild guy. Rock star. Yep. <laughs> but, you know, so. I mean, if I'm to give a history of how I got to where I am now, I mean, Jesus, it was a very, very, very fucking long time <clears throat> of a lot of persistent, you know, uh, persistent persistence. Let's yeah. say is what it really was. And so, you know, once then I'm in a band now that we're on MTV and we, we make another record that goes platinum and we sell four million worldwide. And then we bomb out at a certain point. And I'm back, you know, and I'd done like, you know, I had been in the studio since I was, you know, six or 17. I hope my mother never sees this, but my first <laughs> time, but, you know, way back in the day, and this is probably the most important part of my career was that I had started to get into audio and making demos for bands on four tracks, you know, like Pepper Keenan from Down and Corrosion and Formula always called me like Fulham and the king of the four track, bro. Was, was, so, he, was he the guy that was going against salt and salt and pepper because i that's where yes. i need pepper but it was pepper because i'm from boston so salt and pepper resonated more with me Peppa. i was more of a cinderella yeah. kind of person you know but corrosion conformity was pretty cool too there uh, yeah and <laughs> and so that you know that was a huge part of the moment when i knew well i had to make some money you know, i was living in santa barbara the band broke up uh, we could joke and I was back doing what I've always done. I was back in the studio, just doing 25 an hour, uh, down and out, and eventually and just had a child, you know. And so I made the harsh decision to just run away and go back to Louisiana, where it was a lot cheaper and have my mom to help me raise kids. 
Uh, and then when I got there, that was the only means of survival for me after the band had, had tanked was to go in the studio and start doing local clients. Like, Let me ask you real quick before you go on. How did you originally get into the audio side? Because you said you were in the studio since you were 16, 17. Oh, I At just, what point did you get into the actual recording side of it? Was it just experimentation? Like Experimentation, yeah. I, as a kid, I don't know, I was probably 12 or 13 or something, had discovered a stereo chorus pedal, you know, and that blew me away. So I, I, I bought two amps that I could put up like on my, I think they were like called gorillas or whatever. I put them up on my shelves, my bedroom <laughs> and drive my mom nuts. And I'm like, wait, and it could be that huge. So then I started getting into stereo delay. And I'm like, well, wait, and I started getting into, into stereo reverb. Like how, like, can I make this an arena in my bedroom? Like, and, and, and so it really fascinated me how different I could make sounds, you know? And so then I said, well, shit, man, I want to start making my own music. And so I went and got a four track back in a Fostex, I think. Dude, yeah. hold on, I have a question for you because I started on a Fostex XR7. Okay. Is that a four? Is that a, yeah. It's, it's, it was, no, it was a six because it split two of the tracks into two. Uh, but it also had Dolby yeah. C noise reduction. And I want to ask you, what age were you when you realized that Dolby C noise reduction took out too many of the highs and that you should stay on B? I've, Never really knew that. I know it. You learned something today, Dave Foreman. I rest my case. I'll be here all week. Continue. <laughs> Thank you, Vinny. That, that's a fantastic fact. Uh, I mean, I never knew they changed anything. You know, I, I, I had no idea. I only use chromium dioxide yeah. tanks myself. Well, uh, but, yeah, to, but, to stop well, talking. I recognize that from the from the cassette tape world. But, but you know, I, but the first mixing board that i ever got was once i then you know, it was this new thing called ecstasy <laughs> i started selling it because my, my this is really revealing for the internet but my cousin <laughs> was friends with they what they call the the austin the great pill presser from austin was the first wave of ecstasy in the world this is a horrible thing to put on record i think, but I think the statute of limitations may have passed so you, you might be yeah so we're it. good anyway i was <laughs> making a bunch of money i was like Eight or I think it was seventeen or whatever. So I bought a fucking mixing console, man. It was I don't even know the name. It wasn't. It was before Mackie, but it was similar to like a Mackie twenty four eight, right? Mm -hmm. And so I had that thing set up in my mom's fucking house in my bedroom, and then I really started to get into what audio was and individual tracking or, or individual tracks, and that really started to change my life. I'm like, oh wow, okay, this is what they're doing, you know. So there's all these EQs, and so that's how early I climbed onto it. It's just been a an obsession of mine since mm -hmm. day one, really a bit. I don't know when I've ever stopped, you know? And that's so right. yeah. that's how I got into it. But I mean, I don't know how far you want me to go into this. No, but that's how, that kind no, of, of I think that catches yeah, everyone up. <laughs> how good was the ecstasy though? Was it like yeah. the double stack Mitsubishi's? Cause I remember when that shit came out, like I yeah. took some of that stuff and I didn't even get to the rave. <laughs> that's also a true story. Sorry, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a statute oh, of limitations oh on when your mom can God. no longer be mad at you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> She's always mad. She's a Jewish no. mother. That's her job. <laughs> Benny just said the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. I didn't even get to the rave. That's like, because you know, the <laughs> idea is you're going to take X and go to the rave, but you didn't even make it there. Yeah, that no. was, that's, that's sort of the kind of uh, X that I'm talking about. Bro tip, take, it, take the drugs after you get there. <laughs> Oh my god! Life and, lessons, kiddos. Benny, I forgot the the statement I told you I would never forget when when Shane. Was like, you oh said, "Oh my god, accurate butt." Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. No, so, so, what, so Dave and I had a moment because he enjoyed. I think I'm oh, funny, dude. but it's usually only in my own mind. But Dave is also on the same level of uh, you know scumbaggery that I am. So we both like understand each other. <laughs> so Shane looks at me as we're about to do a, ta a track, the lead singer of the Apocalypse Blues Revival, and I, you know I'm doing a harmony, and he looks at me, and goes, "I got a bigger dick than you," and I look at him, and I go, "Accurate," and then like turn back to sing the harmony, and then I'm like. But also hurtful. And Dave got it on tape, and he was just like, "That's the best time." And I'm like, "Oh!" I think I was. No, like I, a, I, I should put that in the record right after that. So yeah. it was a moment we had. I fucking lost it. Oh my god! That was that was because you don't expect somebody to say something so fucking genius in the moment. Of that. 
Uh, don't feed the animals. Yeah, don't encourage this. <laughs> yeah, um, don't don't just, stroke his ego no, anymore. Then I, I also like that that was just one of many dick jokes made uh, in those sessions. That was uh, <laughs> just that just in that ten minutes is only yeah. one of the yeah, dick jokes we made. <laughs> I, I came in Concurrent after all this jokes. had already passed, so I missed all of that. <laughs> so all right, going from you know doing the musician thing in into being a producer, I think it, it definitely gives you like a, a layer. Um, that some engineers, you know, just, just sometimes they don't have. So, yeah. uh, you know, when it came to the recording side of things, were you, you, you basically, you sound like you were excited about the technology, you know, at as first. much as the music. Uh, so yeah. at what point did it become, I want to take other people's music and, and bring it to a level yeah. where I, you know, where I'm feeling it like that? Well, you know, for years, I, I literally think that I was on the wrong side of it where there's only so much you can do to make the perfect audio recording before you start to realize the thing that makes successful producers is really not that it's, it's a matter of changing people's lives. And I ever started to realize, wait, you know, I'd been a songwriter since I was a kid, uh, been in a band that was successful, had successful songs with Ugly Kid Joe. And when I got home and started to record bands, I, I really started to realize it was this one band it was catch 22 was this band that came in and it was the first time that I realized instead of me worrying about the sounds, I'm like, well, you know what? The, this fucking song is too goddamn long. What could I do to it to make it better for these guys? So then I started to show them that I could edit down things like that. And uh, that became, I mean, there's nothing about engineering that, that made me successful as, as a producer. And if, if you want, it's a, it's a semi long story, but how it actually happened to get to success uh, is nothing more. An, an arrangement and in, in me being able to change people to get them to write different parts and, and do things musically, not sound wise. That's important. Do you think some of that came yeah. from like having known multiple instruments or having recorded? I mean, where do you think some of that knowledge or insight into a good song well, came from in your case? Well, just songwriting in general and knowing when you got to, you know, lulls in songs, you know, like things, how to make something more. It, 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 you know, to make it more extreme than it already is or to take out the parts that I know that, that generally won't appeal to people. I've had a knack for years uh, and had it proven right by Wind Up Records that, that that I can call really great music right away. And this happened because in my hometown, uh, there was all these connections that got made where I was, you know, my old manager from Oka Joe, oddly enough, walked into the same guy tim i told you about that i fucking moved a block away from this is how weird it is so tim's walking in hollywood randomly and he runs across dennis Ryder, the ugly, ugly kid joe manager and this is the point where i'm already back in louisiana i'm just in a studio no longer in the band the band's done and dennis asked him what's dave's up what's dave up to and tim's like oh i just talked to him he's still he's back in louisiana making demos so then dennis calls me my old manager we become hooked up again and so I sent him some of the bands I've been doing. And one of them was a band, Fall From Eden, this punk rock band that was largely ahead of their time and could have been, you know, the next AFI. So I sent him all the demos. Well, he plays them for his current client, Jay Baumgartner, dear friend of ours, who also helped. And he was the assistant engineer on the first Ugly Kid Joe EP. And Jay loves it. So then we start looking for bands to co-produce. Uh, and out of nowhere, this, this little band called 12 Stones, comes to my studio uh, to get better drum sounds from the guy they're getting in New Orleans. So I get the demos up, got them going. And this dude ended up hearing it. it they went to a, this, these motivated kids went to a radio station at like midnight and asked the guy to play it. The dude did. And so the program manager heard it that night at 1230 AM and then freaked out and was like, wait, who is this? And so he had connections at wind up records. So all of a sudden now this band gets a record deal for wind up records and they want to hire jay Baumgartner. that's what the band wants to do and the, the label does too because jay's work been working for wind up for a while well they allow me to co-produce right so it all goes well blah 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 then jay gets an opportunity but he's on seether at the time to do this band called voice it's fire i'm sure you know him from the northeast maybe you don't but it was 2001 well so jay says you know what i got a better idea why don't you let me overlook it? I'll be executive producer, but let Dave Fortman do the album. Cause we just worked with him. You guys love the shit he did with 12 stones. So I get 
this opportunity that's been under scrutiny for months with other producers trying to figure out how to make these arrangements okay. I mean, it's a punk rock band with fucking three bridges, man. They're like, there's shit everywhere. <laughs> so I sat down, I can, went after it, and I show up in Los Angeles to do this thing. It's my first production on my own. And they end up nickna- nicknaming me The Butcher because I fucking... I took a nine minute song and made it three and a half minutes and they fucking loved it. And I remember the A&R guy was blown away by it. And so then all of a sudden, Alan Meltzer, the, the president of, of, you know, the owner of wind up records, him and Diana Meltzer flew down and, and he, he looked at me. Or no, he first, he sat down and listened to this song called Bathory Sainthood. Uh, and I had taken that thing and cha- and the band loved what I did. They were all on board. And so he listened to that and he stopped and he goes, let me listen to that motherfucker again. And he listened twice. And I'm like, I hope this dude didn't pissed off at me. And then he came, he stood up and looked at me in the face and says, you're the butcher, huh? In <laughs> that moment changed my life. So the record finishes up. I go back to Louisiana. I'm down and out, man. I'm just sitting back in the local studio and I get a call from him. He says, I'm going to fly you and your wife to New York. I want to need to have a meeting with you. And so we get up to New York and him and Steve Lerner sat me down and said, look, we we want you to be the vice president of A&R uh, and staff producer for the for the label. And it was wow. a sweet deal. And I'm like, all right, I made it. <laughs> and I go to the hotel and I call fucking my manager, uh, Dennis Ryder and Jay Baumgartner. They're like, nope, <laughs> you're not taking that deal. <laughs> they're, saying, they're, they're like, nope, because that'll cut you out of doing any of the labels and you're way too talented. Trust me, you'll get more bands. And so I'm sitting there going like, fuck, man, you know, I, got, <laughs> I, got, I got two kids, man. I got to take this deal. It was huge. It was 150 grand a year. I could live in Louisiana and get all the points and just produce their bands flying back and forth from New York. I was like, fuck, yeah. And then I had to say, fuck, no, because I had to take the advice of my manager. And it worked out because there would be no Slipknot, Mud, Van, Godsmack, Simple Plan. There's none of that shit happens with, if I take this deal. They had a bunch of shit. They want me to go clean the closet and try to make the arrangements on all these other bands. And I, when I listened to all these bands, I, I realized Dennis and Jay were right. I hated the music. I was like, you know, but in the same meeting. So they also say, you know, we got these three kids from Little Rock, Arkansas. And they've been waiting on Don Gilmore for a year in development. Uh, and it's the band. This little, they're three kids. It's not really a band. But they, they have guys that they play with, but they're three songwriters together. And they're called Evanescence. And so, and, and Alan Meltzer was like, you know, I really think you'd be a better fit than Don Gilmore. And I'm like, well, that sounds great. You know, I mean, it's, there's, you know, nobody, I don't know what this band is. Well, so they, she, so he calls Amy Lee when I leave and she has a fucking shit fit apparently. And Alan told me, yeah, she flipped out. It's like, you know, you're going to throw me to the wolves to this unknown motherfucker, Dave Foreman from Ugly Kid Joe. Fuck you. Oh. So, no, so they get really mad because they've been waiting on Don Gilmore, you know, Lincoln Park producer. Because they, you know, they, but Alan convinces them to have one dinner with me in New Orleans, and then so they come down. Ben and Amy come down, have dinner with it, me and my ex, and uh, and it all changes in that moment. I told them, you know, like the real truth. Like I have the keys to the record company's heart right now. You know, and here's here's what I would do with your songs, and look, like just get involved. We get down and look at the song and the arrangement, and we just make this the best it can be. We can be in the studio. We'll knock this out. So they went for it, and we were in the studio when in three weeks, uh, working on Fallen, which would become the 17 million, you know, number one for 12 weeks in the world fucking album that's still a catalog record. But it wasn't easy, you know. And so after that started to happen, then the rest is history, really. I mean, we went in, and, and let me tell you, no one, not Amy Lee, not the record company. No one thought it would be that big. This was something that 30 something radio stations would not play. Bring me to life. I mean, how big is that song? Yeah. There's like, it took one guy after like 30 tries to, to get one guy to play it. And they got a hundred phone calls, but they didn't fucking play it before that because nobody wanted to hear a goth chick in an orchestra and a piano at the time. Cause goth was the little seventh graders that everybody kicked by the locker in high school until Amy turned all that around. And thank God that one dude played it because people shunned us right out of the gate. You know, all we had was the daredevil soundtrack was all we fucking had, you know, trust me what the reality, but a lot of the times behind big albums like this is that 
yeah, we, we took a chance on something and the world loved it, but before it actually got loved, people fucking will tell you that you're full of shit all the time. This is what happened. And, and it's, it's just, re history has repeated itself the same way. A lot what of was, What was your opinion when you, when you first started working I fucking, on it? Look, I fucking knew, you know, and there's a video. If you look on YouTube, there's us making the goddamn video. It's called Making a Fallen. It's under Downhill 40. You'll see it. And it is incredible because we're just kids that don't know that anything's going to happen. But I knew that at least my musician friends would fucking freak. And I knew one thing that I'd be able to tell my parents that I had a fucking song in a goddamn movie. It was going to be in Daredevil. And that's what we all were blown away by. I was like, that's all I wanted. I just couldn't wait to go to the theater. But little did we know that four months after the release or no, dur I mean, not even that. Just I mean, during the release, four months after the single came out that we would all be in, in, in situations of completely changed lives, man. You know, mine was like, it, I mean, gee, I was sitting there going like, fuck, what is happening right now? <laughs> like it can't keep, it can't keep selling a hundred thousand copies a week. You know, we can't stay in the top 100. For what are we at weeks. right now? Just, just for my Jewish tabulations. Yeah. What are we, uh, <laughs> what are we at now for sales, Dave? Uh, we're looking at probably 18 million worldwide. We're working on eight in the state. Oh, only 18. Yeah, I, just I thought you were going to say like 25, you're going to knock out <laughs> children or something. <laughs> well, wait, Don let me Henley, ask. Don Henley's just laughing at you. 18. <laughs> no, no, now I'm curious. Eagle's greatest hits. Okay, Ben. All yeah. right. <laughs> no, but now I'm curious. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about like some of the transformations that went on in the making of that record? Because I'm interested to hear your experiences that, you know, producing yeah. and, and making changes, like what, how it started versus how it turned out. Can you talk about that? Well, I'll, I'll, uh, as I told yesterday, uh, to this other podcast. Well, one of the biggest examples, right? I mean, very simple stuff, but it mattered a lot. And the band could hear it as well. And the label definitely freaked out. And I got a call from Alan Melter after I'd finished the rough mixes of Bring Me to Life, right? And he was like, it's like, Foreman, sounds like you went over every fucking bar in that song, you know, <laughs> in his New York voice. God, I miss that guy. Uh, and I was like, well, I did, man. It's like I've been... You know, my wife at the time, I'd be at Oakwood's apartments. I wouldn't sleep. I'd be out there in the van cranking that thing. I'm like, I think I got it, man. It's going to be in a movie, bro. You know, so. Mm -hmm. so Ben Affleck's going to make this. Yeah. So here's what you're asking, Jamal, is uh, if you look at the original structure, and you could probably find it on YouTube, well, it used to go after the chorus, it would go into the what is now Bridge A. You know, the bring me to. But now, but now, but now. But. And that drove me nuts. I thought, well, this is fucking going into the bridge every time we leave a chorus. So I took those parts and, and added them, doubled them up in the bridge to where it became bridge A. Then they go to the frozen in time part afterwards. And so that major, that change alone in, in, the, in those little breaks, they go, you know, the, that shit used to be a disco keyboard. It was all and I'm like, nah, we're, we've got to figure something out. And so we literally spent the one that you hear where it goes like, it goes strings into static. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Took about eight hours, right? So we're, me and Dave Hodges and Amy and Van were beating our heads against the fucking wall to make these transitions better. So we got that one and we're all, yes. And so now we got to do the first one. And so we got, we hit a brick wall and I said, well, wait a minute. Well, let's just do nothing. Just cut the time in half. The first one goes, home bang wake me up inside so that was that kind of construction on songs which we've been there for like a day trying to get these fucking transitions right and that furthered into back when we you know like i had to like i got josh freeze to do the the album you know a friend of mine from way back uh, I also found the bass player you know i had to get these people together there's only three people there's no band right so i get mm -hmm. i found the bass player well, I'll get to that, but in the construction of the song, those are the kind of things that happen. So in, in the in the initial tracking, man, also the outro, I felt, is doing the same thing over and over and over. So that's why he's going, you know, all the things, he's going big and it's just in the open, the guitars open up, you know, and relentless, I mean, relentless work to uh, get Amy to sound, you know, her best. Little easier on that one, you know. My immortal, a lot harder to get some of the phrases like the outro phrase and the bridge, 
Well, I think there's probably 50 of those, but not in the same takes. They're probably, you know, I would spread them out. If I have her singing something fantastic on a song two weeks later, then I go like, all right, you're you're in the zone. Let's go back to my immortal. Let's get the outro phrase. I've been alone, alone all these years. And th this, this is endless stuff, and it's all arrangement stuff, you know, and imaginary. I don't know if you guys know this record. But Imaginary, I think, is one of the pinnacle songs of the entire fucking record. The one that starts with a string intro. It is the middle point in the record. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just more examples of, of what I had to do. They, they had this beautiful intro. You know. Dun, 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 the sound of my screaming. Cannot dun, 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 whatever the lyrics are. Fear or Before it gets into 76 fucking people playing at one time in a solo section. Well, that was originally an intro that they had completely thrown away. So I had to go dig it out of the trash. They had to go find like another hard drive in the car or something that even had it on there. Oh I said, gosh. look, what if that's the bridge breakdown? You know, what if this becomes all this emotion and it goes, you know, in my field of paper flowers, it comes out of that shit and hits this thing in the, in the bridge breakdown. And so as soon as they heard that version of it, we went and cut it back into Pro Tools on another drive. They were blown away. And then the A&R guy shows up and he's blown away by it. So these things started to unfold more and more and more uh, with, you know, it because sometimes they don't, man. And I'll tell you later on, sometimes arrangements go wrong and you have to maybe up, get beat up by somebody almost, but they don't really beat you up, but they're trying to. So with with this record, just while we're on it, uh, just to go a little deeper, you're doing your butcher thing and you're going through and, and like you said, you're working with uh, Amy Lee on the, the vocals and stuff. Yeah where uh where's the direction coming from are you listening to what they have and refining it like is there what kind of aspect for your vision are you are you inputting like how do you see that collaboration coming to that product well in the moment where you're doing the real vocal it's going to become the real vocal it's one-on-one -on -one. it's it's me against her in, in a very friendly way against <laughs> it's interesting yeah yeah it, you know i become i'm the coach you know yeah and, and I don't care how great you're throwing passes. There's probably something you could be doing better here. And so I'm just listening for what I've always done in the moment. And I'm focusing on a vocal. I need to feel like it's something that I'm going to like as a listener. And that's been a, a great advantage for me to have a vision that other people labels. And really, I mean, in those days, it was all about can you make this a, a better record, not only for the band, but you got to please the label too. These people are super good critics and they have great ears, man. They got a and R people is, you know, there's five or six dudes that have to run this over. And so that's the reason they put me in the hot seat in the first place is they'd already loved the work I'd done before. And that is me and Amy sitting in a fucking studio and we're going through it. You know, we go through the verse we're measuring like all the shit that you saw me do with Shane, you know, going through all that to make it feel special you know and it, another good example is the, you know the first intro dun, 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 or whatever it is on bring me to life right that piano well david hodges originally played it just like a normal piano and it was i thought it was too key heavy and i pointed out it was his third finger on his fucking right hand it was killing the whole fucking show and so we went over that thing probably 20 30 times right to get get him to play it that soft in that creepy and when i could hear that it was that creepy where it took me into a different world then i know that i'm fucking done and that goes with every artist that's just the way i work and it, i won't stop until i feel like it's something that's going to change people's lives and especially in a pressure zone of i got alan milter and wind up records depending on me to make this album rad so that's how it works speaking of these vocal things about amy man that's that's how we do it just go through it and then we figure out what is great and what's not and back then we were even taking it to the extent of doing vocal comps i would have her do verses in each of each of these verses i would punch to where they're the best they could be and then we'd do three or four of these things punched not all straight through and then i would actually go back and i would look at all the best parts from the, the four i had that had all been punched already and then now figure out the all-star lineup of what that verse will be 
I mean, it was. I like that you only had to choose from three <laughs> when Ben and I are working say, on twenty different yeah. things. Oh my gosh, I'm going yeah, to pull. So I'm going to pull the 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 T from this word because that was really good. In the, the <laughs> I was going to say yeah. three. Corey will, will literally do like twenty takes where he's just like, let's go word by word, and make sure that you don't suck, and then still be like, I'm not sure if we have it, and we're still doing punches yeah. afterwards. So I think that that's adorable and also a testament to Amy Lee. Yeah. But I have to ask you something very important because yeah. you know the arrangement. It, it's it is so important. Do you ever now that like okay you sold eighteen million records of just this record alone sit and hear it on the radio and go hmm that was a good idea I should have that yeah bridge <laughs> A that was that was it and, and and make those mental notes so for next time you know you, when yeah, you feel course. that way are, are you trusting is it always a a gut thing is it coming from the gut when you yeah, do those no, arrangements I just have always had a knack for knowing for for three and a half minutes long what can how you can compact something to make it be a lot more emotional than it was before i've just had a really i just have a natural talent for doing that and that's why the rec, the labels hired me to do it and yeah every but when i hear like bring me life on the radio i mean i just straight to high five and myself i'm like fuck yeah bitch i fucking get it <laughs> yeah I, seriously you, i mean you can't deny i mean it, I mean, it, it lives on it k-rock does. la twice a day man you know, I mean, it went number one at pop radio. It was the biggest, that album during Bring Me to Life Success was the number one selling record on the planet for 12 did weeks. You get po- did you get points? Did it bring your bank account to life? Uh, well, yeah, I brought my bank account. Hell yeah. <laughs> God bless you, Dave Fortman. <laughs> Other producers listening, remember, sometimes it's better to get points. Yeah, have, you, you need to have good management, good representation. My manager, who was a lawyer as well, did a great job on those contracts. My God. Uh, yeah. So that's a how whole other episode. Of yeah, I was going to I was going to ask. Yeah. How did you find it? Because that's an interesting thing that a lot of people don't know about. I mean, how did you find or how did a manager find you? Where, where, like, how did that start? Well, it's the guy that Tim, the dude from Sugar Tooth, ran into. It was my old manager from Ugly Kid Joe, mm-hmm. you know, and so he ended up managing. He was managing Jay Baumgartner at the time. So he was getting into producer management. So he wanted to add me to the team. And after Jay had heard the demos I was doing, they both were like, holy shit, we got to get Dave in the game here. I'll, let's find something to co-produce with Dave, which we did, the 12 Stones record. But yeah, it was my old manager. I mean, I, I had already had him for all the Ugly Kid Joe years. And he, mm-hmm. you know, he passed away a couple of years ago. But he, oh. he was just a fabulous dude that was really good at what he did. And man, he he did a bunch of great deals for me. All those deals, the Slipknot deals, the Godsmack stuff, you know, all of it. Wow. And so I didn't really... I didn't go into production and suddenly have to look for a manager, which sure, yeah. Yeah. can Happens be difficult. And I don't, you know, but I'm not so sure these days you even need a manager. Like now I just have Andy Lurie, who's uh, used to be managed Evanescence at one point, another brilliant lawyer, just doing the stuff for me. You know, I don't really need a manager because in my, I mean, well, in history, man, like, you know, there's only – so much of a peak, unless you're Rick Rubin or, or maybe a handful of guys, you know, I'm very lucky. You know, I had a solid decade of, of rocking, you know, and I'm still doing stuff. But the fact is a manager often doesn't really create the work because the work is either going to come to you or it's not based on mm-hmm. your resume. And I kept, you know, and sometimes I'd be mad. I'd be like, you know what? I'm like, dude, what the fuck am I paying you 15% for? You're not getting me any work. Like Joey Jordan just called me for Slipknot because he just was on the road with Amy and fucking Chad from Mudvayne. And they're like, I just got this gig and I got to give you 15%. Why am I not paying you just a lawyer fee? So those questions would, would, would come into view, but yeah, in general, first thing you want to seek, if you're being, you know, a, a, even a semi professional producer that might have work because you never know when something's going to blow up and we we proved that with evanescence right now it happens all the time you got to be covered in point systems if you're a producer regardless and that's advice to young producers because you don't know man you know it could be be some band that you don't think's going to blow up and they fucking do and you're like oh oh fuck i should have had at least a point on that record you know so i forgot your question but that's a bunch of it. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, thank you. Got it, man. All, all great information. <laughs> well, maybe maybe we can pick up. So what? how did your life change or your career after working on this Evanesc- Evanescence album? I mean, what, like you mentioned uh, yeah, Slipknot, well, like what happened after that? What was the trajectory? Oh, yeah, step by step. I mean, that thing's through the roof. 
it wasn't very long. It was only the next year that then Mudvayne, after they had uh, the success of their second record, which both of those records were huge, they were heading into their third record. And at the, see, when you would do a record as big as Fallen, then you become in the list of people that record labels now want to present to the bands. They say, well, let's look after producers or look for producers. Well, I was one on the list. And so Chad and those guys saw, because, you know, I have an, another whole history of production before 12 Stones and I, I, I got famous producing was back when I was doing all these NOLA bands, you know, I got, I was doing Phil Anselmo, Super Joint Ritual. Well, Chad saw that, you know, and they're big Pantera fans. So he's like, wait, this dude worked with fucking Super Joint. And that was a, one of his favorite records, Super Joint Ritual. He's like, this guy did Super Joint Ritual and Evanescence. Like, fuck, we got to talk to this guy. That's some range. That's <laughs> a huge range. And so they flew me out to, uh, Sa I think they were Sausalito. Yeah, they were Sausalito doing, or somewhere in California, doing pre-pro for it. And I went out and met them in this house, you know, and uh, that's most of how it, all of these gigs have really gone is, is really, I have to show up and, and, and sell it. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to show up and give them your vision and what you would be doing with the record. And then, then it, then it becomes my, my life changed. Then it, from that moment on, I only did bands that were famous and that, you know, I, I don't think I did a, maybe one new band in that entire time. And I built a big studio based on the fact that mostly when producers get that big, when you have 17 million sold, a lot of new bands come, but not me, man. Somehow I got dragged into continuing careers, which mm -hmm. turns out that I'm fucking great at that too. But the battles involved with changing someone's mind that's already famous it is a lot more intense. And it really brought Can you give me us an example of that. Well, I will. Yep. So I show up, so I get the gig from Mudvayne, right? But well, it turns out, you know, I had this vision for the song Happy. I don't know if you remember that song, but it was oh, like... Yeah. Oh, yep. oh, yeah. That was a huge song. <laughs> huge. Did you have a question mark on the end of it or something? Uh, yeah. Are you happy? Yeah. yeah. But this would turn out to be my first endeavor into real battles against what I believe the that the music should sound, what should the arrangement should be like and how it would go versus the band that's already famous and they just want to do their fucking thing. So we get to Sausalito, we go to pre-pro and they can't understand what the fuck I'm trying to say. I'm, I'm saying, look, you're doing math rock all the way through the verse. I mean, let's try to give people a break, man, here. <laughs> and so they just couldn't fucking understand it. So I made, so I, I went home that night called Stacks, Jeremy Parker, my engineer. And I was like, dude, I th I'm definitely getting fired, man. So, I mean, I think they're, pr they're probably going to cancel plane flights, the whole deal, because they, they weren't feeling it the first day. They so I said, I'm going to give it hell tomorrow and see what happens. So I walk in, I said, all right, give me the fucking guitar, Greg, because I got nothing to lose at that point. And so I, I said, look, imagine it's all done. Then it breaks down to... But on the name and but on because he couldn't figure that fucking guitar part out the day before, so I played it for him. And I said, "Now, Chad, sing over that in the verse that you were singing before." And then, then they started to understand it. And I'm like, "Now, give me a more simple fucking beat, Matt, on the drums, because he was doing a three four on a four four, which is out of. I mean, it's what they do, but I just mm -hmm. want to have the world to hear what the fuck the hook is before we get into <laughs> the math rock. You know, what a concept. So that and so that's one of the first battles where they weren't feeling and then all of a sudden they start to really understand what I'm talking about. And they're like, Oh shit. And so that doesn't stop there. And then there's another one called fucking determined, which is a, was another video that came out on that album. Great song, but also more lack of dynamics in my opinion. So I got to speak up if I'm hearing it. And so Matt really loses, you know, no, no, you know, no producers ever really changed my fucking drums. Blah, blah, blah. He's trying to stab holes in the toms, you know, and I'm thinking, this oh, this dude's coming across a drum set, man. He's going to come, fuck, we're going to fight. I was like, this dude's going to try to beat me up, man. And then Greg shuts him down, like, hey, bro, you know, just calm down. You know, because Greg's a songwriter. And he's like, we could always put it back. Let's just hear what the fuck he's got to say again, man. You know, like, this was a major battle in my life. And I started to realize, wow, this is a lot more difficult than starting with a new band like Evanescence, where there, there's nothing, there's no career for them to 
lay their fucking sack on your face over. <laughs> so, and look, that's, oh you know, and, and that's, that's just one of them, you know, it, it's dear. It, it, it's, it's dear to my heart as Sully is, and it will always be, you know, this, the, these, these were years. Well, my took, mom, that's a lead singer of Godsmack mom. They're, uh, yeah. they're Ray, the th third biggest yeah. active rock band, according to the oh. billboard magazines, but Sully, it's not just the guy in Dorchester. He's actually a guy that sits yeah. in the band. <laughs> well, this was one, one of the, probably the hardest ones ever really was, you know, showing up for the Oracle in 2009. We go, we go to Los Angeles. We're in the, a, re, a, re, a rehearsal space. So, so the first day goes absolutely shit, you know, and so he explains to me that that, that night he's like, you know, I mean, we're just a kind of band that we already kind of know where we want things, you know, um, arrangement wise and like part wise, blah, blah, blah. So he's basically just annihilate me in, in this conversation. <laughs> I'm just like, damn, man. All right. So here we go again. This is another shit show. And so and I come in the next morning and I realize I'm listening to, I don't know what they were doing. It was some way, some reason the sound guy was, he was making, it was, you know, one of their guys was doing the, the rehearsal sound. And I realized he's playing a piece of one of the songs and I'm like, two songs that they're probably going to throw away could be one song. And so I present that to him. And so he's just all like, I don't know, that ain't going to work, man. So then Shannon speaks up and says, well, let's try it. Let's just play it real quick. And so the Sully, diplomat of them all, yeah, Shannon, Shannon Larkin. Larkin yeah. Yeah. So they pick the up diplomat. their, so they pick up their instruments and they actually play the song. And when the song stop, I'll never forget what that do. What Sully said to me, he says, he goes, man, I don't know whether to punch you or hug you, man. <laughs> he goes, I fucking love it, man. So, so then we continued to sort of get into get stuff, you know, and, and not a whole lot of changes. They don't really need a whole lot of changes, but they do need some here and there and some calls here and there, you know. And so then I, I established a working relationship with him and that went on for another Three records, you know, we did with him. We did Thousand Horsepower, which he really loves that record to this day. So you think it's just basically kind of building a trust uh, and like that once yeah, you it, once you crack that, you know, that code, does it mm -hmm. seem to kind of go a little smoother or, you know, is it ever oh, yeah. a constant, you know, yeah, you, really, after one hill, there's another hill kind of thing. There's always the next hill to climb. But the fact is, you got to have great ideas. That's the only thing that gets you past people like this, man. I mean, this these are some pressure situations man if they're already famous and they've had you know three fucking gold or platinum records like slipknot man but slipknot also would be the 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 largest mountain i've ever climbed in any production and well worth it uh that was boy that was no easy feat you know i show up and those fuckers are on different islands from each other they don't have to talk in they're not you know and i got all the I already know the demos. I love them, you know, and the main songwriters, and I, you know, have to say this, I hope they don't mind because, because a couple of them really shit on me in the fucking press later, but they came back and kind of took it all back or whatever. But the main songwriter guys are really just Joey and Paul. And then Corey writes the lyrics. That's, you know, this is, you know, Joey wrote what, uh, what's a goddamn song, you know, I listen to Rick Rubin to down there. Well, gunk, gunk. All I could, whatever the fucking song is. Well, that entire song was written by Joey Jordanson in his fucking mom's basement, you know. But anyway, those guys, at the time that I came into the project, were so famous and so fucking rich that everybody now wants to be a songwriter. So all of a sudden, I got to deal with all these other demos. And I, I, I don't want to do that. I want. I mean, me and Corey both agreed that we love, and he had already written all the lyrics to all these demos. So they had a meeting, like Jim and 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 Clown. It, it had a meeting. Me and Corey had to go to this dinner where they were like, you know, we're tired of just being like, like Joey's bullshit riffs all the time, man. We have, you know, we we think there needs to be more writing, and this meant that I need to focus on their writing. Is what it meant. So this entire battle starts. Now there's two camps. They go rent an entire studio's worth of shit. In, in the house where the studio was in, in Jamaica, Iowa. And so now it becomes this competition, you know, of them writing this kind of Pink Floydy, weird psychedelic shit over there, taking mushrooms versus me and Joey and, and Corey over there 
making fucking the real album that would become the real album. Is this the album they keep teasing that Paul did before he passed that like it's still like on the shelf? It's the last thing Paul ever did. Yeah. Was mine. I, had, Cheer, I have the last record. Paul, by the way. Yeah, I have the last record with with those dudes on it before they they passed away. And wow. and it is a special record, man. It really is. And it went platinum over the game in a recount on Billboard. It was just, just a smashing moment for all of us. And has been, uh, I think, the highest amount of singles in one record they've ever had. And it's, one of the battles of my life was that, you know, Corey had given me a, a garage band demo of the song Snuff uh, out of his kitchen. He did it alone. And I, I told him, I said, holy shit, I can't even fucking drive out to the studio without listening to this and just wrecking the fucking van. Because I used to love to rent minivans because I'm weird. But this fucking song was so appealing and special to me. And I told him, this is what, the, you know, I call it the river, man. The timeless river of music. And if you can become part of that river, then you live on forever. It's, you have a better chance. And I told him, this is where this shit could be on the real river, man. This is it. So we're building the album. And so the other guys talked him in. So I go over there to check on those dudes one time and I see the fucking word snuff on their chalkboard. And I'm like, oh, fuck no. I said, Corey, I need you to come next door real quick. I need you to lay this down on a click for me, right? So he comes in. We lay it on a click. We talked about the vision of the song. And I said, all right. And he sang a, a vocal straight through to it, right? And I said, just let me build this motherfucker tonight. And I, I swear to God, this will be rad. And so I got, I spent all day. I got everybody to come play these things. And I moved them all. I asked Joe, is it okay if I move your drums? I just make, I try Frankenstein the fuck out of this thing. I had Jim play all the way through. I started moving everything around. Uh, made it into almost exactly what it is right now, you know, except for like one chop that happened in the bridge arrangement or whatever. But, and I shit you not, man, that vocal performance is still the same thing that he did that's on the record. It's just a one, it's a, it's a one take run through. And it just was magical. I so, have goosebumps. Wow. I literally do. Yeah. That's incredible. So look, so he came in the next day and I said, man, I want to play this, this, I, and this dude cried his fucking face off for this song. Cause it meant so, so much to him. And I never seen, I never seen him cry like that in ever in my life, not for the whole session, but he cried his fucking face off in there with me and my engineer sitting there. And I said, I told you motherfucker that I would make this happen for you. This is what it's really all about, man. You know, and that has nothing to do with, anything other than that song itself and being in the right format where we wanted it to come out on stages and build like it does and have what he's saying be important to the world. And man, did it, did it work out? And so that, that battle didn't stop with just the band because the band didn't want to play it. Like Joey just was like, yeah, whatever, I'll play this shit. So I took it, you know, I took bar by bar and just made it into what I wanted to make it. So then we get the next level of uh, battle coming up when Monty Connor and these guys, we get down to single three and these fucking nice gentlemen, <laughs> these nice gentlemen, <laughs> these very intelligent, nice gentlemen want to put out Sean's song from next door till we die. It doesn't even have Joey playing the fucking drums. And I said, dude, what the fuck? I said, how, how can you not consider snuff to be a single? And so then I get an apology two weeks later saying, oh man, we tested snuff. It's, oh, it's through the roof. So it came out and it was smashing number one. Uh, what a victory that was for me. Cause I had to go through hell to, to even to get that fucking song where it was, man. God That's damn. incredible, man. That was yeah. probably the biggest battle of my goddamn life. And it was well worth it, man. All I've learned from yeah. all of wow. this is that drummers, especially ones that play and think that they can do rush and air um, are so hard to change their mind because the only thing I ever thought about with Mudvayne when I first saw them was, all right, I like this, but Dream Theater needs to explain to me what's happening. And <laughs> yeah. then, you know, and then Sully, for people that don't know, was also a drummer and still is a drummer. He probably would tell you he's a drummer still. And he's well, a if you want to hear, but if you want to hear him play, drummers, his, drummers. if you want to hear Sully play the drums, just listen to the first fucking record. So that's I him know. playing the drums. He'll tell you. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. That's incredible, man. We're uh, we're coming up on the end of our first hour. You know, I feel, amazing oh, stories, damn. It, you know, we we like always like to kind of get the backstory, and then by the end of this, you know, we're talking about 
these you know multi-million uh album sale records it's it's incredible to hear the story behind them so thank you thank you for taking the time with us um is there anything that you want to let our several dozen listeners or viewers know about ugly kid joe we just released uh one of my uh, another one of my songs called long road it's out today oh amazing see it on youtube yeah very beautiful song we'll put a link uh in the description below yeah beautiful song written by a beautiful man (laughs) (laughs) you're a legend nobody even needs to know they'll find you (laughs) how rad is it on the scale of like rad and then like that's fucking radical on the dave fortman chart is this new ugly kid joe song so i could send it it to my mom oh your mom will love it it's kind of it's a softer song kind of country you know you'll you probably like it i don't know i I consider it to be extremely rad nice extremely <laughs> rad okay and we'll get we'll get more into sure. the radness uh next yeah. week with dave fortman <laughs> thanks for hanging with us guys check out 2020-d.com and we'll see you next week and check out the new ugly kid joe for yeah fun. please do yeah because we've always been a band that you know we you don't see us like it wasn't like an mtv band you know we're we're, we're pretty faceless that's what's the title of that and, and it's because you know we fly under the radar but when people hear you know, a song, oh, wow, that's, oh, that's Godsmack. Like, they know our song, Voodoo or whatever, or I Stand Alone or whatever song. They'll know that, but not the name of the band, you know, because we're not, we don't, we don't oversaturate. And Sully is really, I wouldn't even say it's his genius that makes it like that. It's just the way he operates and wants to make a different record every time.